I'm tired. I'm busting my hump. I deserve the rapture. I deserve heaven. I better, get a, I better have a mansion. Like, it better not be some sleazy shack in the backwoods. Like, I want a mansion. And there better be a gold street going to it, and I need six car garage. Like, I'm going, I deserve this stuff. And what Paul's saying, and the reality that the promises are not very cool if you think you deserve it or you think you can earn it, but we don't deserve it. That's a key for you in your Christian life as a foundation for your family and for you. You, I, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve any of it. We got to realize that. Paul says that's a basic truth to the rapture is that we don't deserve it. For it is by grace, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift, not by works, so that you can't boast. In Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteousness is like filthy rags. We don't deserve any of it. Number three, we are all fools if Christ didn't rise. I love that. Like, Paul's like, we're all, you, you and I are fools. This morning is pointless. There is no reason for you to be in those seats. There's no reason for me to be up here if Christ did not rise from the dead. 17, 18, and 19. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Oh, awesome news. Thank you, Paul. Then those also have fallen asleep in Christ. They are also lost, so the dead people are lost as well, those who have passed away. And if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all the others. And what Paul's basically saying is we're all basing our future on the faith that Christ rose from the dead. Because Paul does not write, hey, if, if Christ didn't come down to earth as a baby, we're, we're, it's pointless. He did not write, hey, if Christ doesn't die for your sins on the cross and carry your burden, it's pointless. What Paul writes is if Jesus Christ is in the ground, in the Middle East somewhere still, this all is pointless. Because then he's just another guy who died and his body and his bones are buried somewhere and he never rose and he never rose again and he never... And then, so therefore, you're, you're not promised the resurrection either, Paul says. If Christ didn't come to earth, all those things that he, he says... And, and here's the amazing thing. Look at verse 20. I'm telling you, I, I got to write a book called The Butts of the Bible. It, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul says, look, he says, look, you're basing your, your, your future on the faith that Christ rose from the dead. Now, I've never seen the risen Christ. Have any, I mean, unless you've said it, you're, you're holding something back, none of you have seen the risen Christ. But Paul goes, I saw the risen Christ. The apostles saw the risen Christ. Peter saw the risen Christ. And 500 early believers saw the risen Christ. And we're all taking that on faith. And because we're basing our future on the faith that Christ did indeed rise from the dead, here are two amazing promises. Because Christ did rise from the dead. He is the first fruit of all that will eventually one day rise from the dead. And here are two promises that you can bank on based on the fact that Christ did indeed rise from the dead. Promise number one. I, lo I love this one. I love all these. Honestly, I love all these. Ready? Number one, your body rocks. Your body will rock. Your body rocks. Listen, I'm going to read. You don't have to follow along. I think they'll be on the screen behind me, but listen to a couple of these verses in 1 Corinthians 15. When we sow, we do not plant the body that will be, but just the seed, perhaps of wheat or of something Else, so say, and then drop down to verse 42. So it will be in the resurrection of the dead, in the rapture, when the dead rise first in Christ and meet the Lord in the air, and then those of us who are alive go to meet the Lord in the air. This is the same thing that will happen then. The body that is sown is perishable. It will be raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It will be raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It will be raised in power. It is sown in the natural body, and it will be raised in in the spiritual body, verse 48, And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man all these years on earth, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Down to 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We will not, but we will all be changed in the flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will be changed. Here's what Paul's saying. I brought this morning and I glued it on a piece of construction paper. Can you all see? I, this is a watermelon seed. Can you all see this? Watermelon seed. That's pretty cool. You can't see it. Why can't you see this? Okay. Watermelon seed. Orange piece of paper. I was going for contrast. Black on orange. But anyway, it's fine. Paul says, this is your body. Your body is like a seed. My body is like a seed. A watermelon seed. Any other kind of seed. Whatever. It's a seed. 
And for the seed to be what it's meant to be, for it to become fully what it is, which is, which is, a, which is a what? Which is a watermelon. It, what has to happen? It has to go into the ground. It has to die, like not become a seed anymore. And it has to be grown into a watermelon. And but, but what else is interesting is that in this seed is, is like the DNA, is the ability to become something more. Right? With water and, and nutrients, it, it no longer is a seed. It becomes... It becomes, it becomes a watermelon. This is your heavenly body. You will all be watermelons in heaven. <laughs> Sounds like a VeggieTales episode. Yeah! This is what we are now. This, our earthly bodies are seeds of what is to come. And we don't even understand what all of this means. But look at the contrast. This is what we are now. This is the things we struggle with now. This is what we live through now. This is what we fight through now. And one day, when, when the resurrection, when the rapture occurs, we will all be caught up to be with the Lord. And in an instant, our bodies will be changed from a seed to a watermelon. I want to be a watermelon. That's amazing. That is an amazing promise. But it's not an amazing promise if you think you deserve to be a watermelon. You don't deserve it. You deserve this, little peeny little seed. You get this. That's an amazing promise from the rapture. Listen to what Randy Alcorn, I don't know what to do with this watermelon now. Randy Alcorn in his book called Heaven writes this, and I think we need to understand some characteristics of of what we will be. Uh, Conversion does not mean eliminating the old, but transforming it. See, we're not getting rid of the seed. We're just becoming what what we should be, what we were created to be, okay? Despite the radical changes that occur through salvation, death, and resurrection, we remain who we are. We have the same history. We have the same appearance. We have the same memory, interests, and skills. If you look at Jesus' resurrected body physically, people recognized who he was. I'm going to be able to walk up, I'm going to be able to walk up to Carl and recognize that it is Carl Fisher in heaven. We're not going to be like out-of-body experience, floating on clouds with harps and angels' wings. That's a bunch of hooey, okay? It's going to be Carl. It's going to be Liz. It's going to be Mark. It's going to be Chris. It's going to be Mike. It's going to be the same person. And not only that, we're going to have history with that person. We don't just suddenly forget everything we knew. And I'm like, well, who's that dude? No, I'll remember that I did ministry with, with you guys, with you as a church. You'll remember me. We'll be able to talk about these these Sunday mornings and, and all the other ministry that, takes, uh, uh, takes, that goes on during the week. Like, we're not just going to completely forget everything we ever knew and just walk around and be like, hey, that's no, that would not be very fun. What's the point of that? Like, wh- what's the purpose in that? No, we're going to have history. We're going to physically be the same, but we're going to be different. We're still going to be a watermelon, but the, same, it's the change from a seed to the actual fruit. Christ is the first fruit. We're now the actual fruit. We're going to be able to appear in a room like Christ did. Now that's pretty cool. I'm going to be able to jump my Jeep off that hill and get out of the car in midair because I don't want to do the landing. All right? That's pretty cool. Like we were, we're going to be different. Our physical bodies will be different. It'll be changed. But in the same way, there's things that will remain the same. And that's an amazing promise. <laughs> I was at Juicy O's writing this sermon, actually. And behind me, I don't usually eavesdrop, but I couldn't help myself because th- there's two guys, two business guys, they're talking about money that they were investing in, in the market and how they did last year and how they're going to do it this year. And I was like, I, I don't have a dime to invest, so I really had no business in the conversation until I heard the figure that they were investing. And I was like, oh, I should totally share Christ with them because I, you know, I was just kidding. Um, so <laughs> $1.47 million. And instantly in my head, I'm going, oh, what would I, like, what would I do with $1.47 million? And then you know what I thought of? This truth. And I was like, yeah, but my body's going to rock. You, my body's going to be so awesome, and I'm going to be in heaven, and I can't touch this. No, nah, no, nah. Like, yeah. Like, I was like, yes. I, my body is rocking. Like, I will give up $1.5 million to the promise that when I am raptured, I go with be with the Lord, I, my body will rock. And your body will rock too. And that is an amazing promise when you realize that we don't really deserve that. Here's the second amazing promise. How am I? The clock is gone. Sweet. All right. (laughs) All right. The second amazing promise. Death will die forever. 53 to 56. Actually, let me just pick it up in 54. Then this thing that will be, uh, that 
Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, at the rapture, death dies forever. That is an amazing promise. And it's not just that no one else dies. All of the dead in Christ become alive. See, right now we still experience death. Like God has promised, Jesus Christ on the cross promised, that, and, and he has paid for it, and he has overcome death, but it hasn't actually become a physical reality yet. All of you and myself will die if the Lord does not come back. We were all going to reach that day where we take our last breath and we pass away. It's just true. We're all going to experience death at some point during our lives, whether it's a loved one or something like that. We're all going to experience death. But the amazing promise of the rapture is that death dies forever. And there is no more dying, but all those who have passed away in Christ will be raised again and they will become alive and you will be able to converse with them like I am conversing with you now. Except for it will be a two-way conversation instead of a one-way conversation, hopefully. All right, so that's an amazing promise because you know what? Death, death stinks. It is a sting, 1 Corinthians says. My grandma passed away six years ago. My grandma was not a believer in Jesus Christ. And it didn't get me, it didn't hit me until we went to the funeral. And I actually saw, me and my brother Mike were there. He's, a, he's three years younger than me, so he's old enough to get all this stuff. And I actually saw them lowering my grandmother into the ground. And I just knelt down like this. And my brother knelt down next to me. Because everybody else had left because they didn't want to see it. But I wanted to see it. Because I wanted to experience, sounds weird, I wanted to experience the sting that death is. When someone passes and doesn't know Christ. Because death is a sting. And there's tears coming down my eyes because I realize that my grandma, based on God's word, my grandma's not going to get that resurrected body. I looked at my brother, and if he was here, he would tell you, because he remembers. I said, Mike, promise me right now that we spend the rest of our lives making sure we don't feel this. That as many people as we will bury, because death is a reality, that we don't feel this sting of hopelessness right now. That we spend the rest of our lives living and preaching and teaching the gospel and out in front of people and from God's word, so that we don't have to feel the sting of death. The amazing promise about the rapture is that death is dead forever. And we don't experience the hopelessness because in Christ Jesus there is hope. Not just for this life, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, but for the life to come. Because if you only have Christ and hope for this life, it's pointless. But you have Christ and you have hope for eternity as well. That is an amazing promise that we don't deserve. And so all of those truths, all of those promises... And what do we do with it? How do we live? The thing I love about Paul is Paul just doesn't give you a bunch of theology, a bunch of foundational doctrine. Because if you look in verse 58, he says, therefore. He's like, because these things are true, these three things are true. Because these amazing promises are true and they will happen. Because we can base our, our life and we know for sure that the rapture is going to happen. Here's what I want you to do, Paul says. My dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, letting nothing move you. Stand firm on those three things. It is by Christ, it is by grace, and it is by the resurrection that Christ is our first fruit. And that's what he says. He says, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the Lord. And that's not what he says. He says, just make it through this life, get to the rapture, and then have all the good stuff. That's not what he says either. He says, just put your head down and, and, and then get all of the Christians in a, in a, in a, in a holy little huddle and then just, just get, get through and, and then make sure everybody has enough stuff and then, and then one day when, when the rapture comes, it'll be, a, it'll be a great time. And then that's when the party starts. That's not what he says either. Honestly, what he says shocked me when I read it. But it doesn't shock me not. This is what he says. Give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. And you're like, oh, Ben, like, that's good for you because you're a pastor. You're giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Only problem with your argument is that he's writing to the church at Corinth, not the preachers in Corinth. 
He says, give yourselves to the work of the Lord. I skipped this verse because I'm not really, I mean, back to verse 10, Paul writes this, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. This grace to me was not without effect. He's saying, by God's grace, God's grace on me, the fact that I did not deserve what I got, it didn't have no effect on me. I didn't sit back and do nothing. I didn't skate through life and say, ah, oh, you know what? I got God's grace. I don't have to do anything. I won't sin, but I'm not going to do anything else. And so I have God's grace. It covers me. Look what he says. No, I worked harder than all of them. Paul just said he worked harder than all the apostles put together. Paul's like, I worked hard, not because I had to, because I got to. I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Paul's like, I wasn't just working so I could earn the rapture. I wasn't just er working to earn my way to heaven. I was, he's like, by God's grace in me, the fact that I realize I don't deserve it, I'm working harder than all of them. Here's what to do. Now what? Give yourselves fully to God's work. Give yourself to God's work, not just to God. Give yourself to God's work, not just to God. Paul says the effects of these truths and these promises on my life was that I worked really, 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 really hard for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, are, are you working hard for the gospel, the truth, of Jesus Christ. Are you working hard? Some of us are, are working really hard, and I hate to sp spout out the old cliche that 10% that of the people do 90% of the work, because I, I really don't feel like that in this church. I, I feel like you, like you all do a lot of hard work. But the reality is that some of us are working hard, and that our work, if you finish that verse, is not in vain, because the rapture is true, and one day we will be rewarded in heaven. And some of us, quite honestly, with all the love in my heart, some of us don't do a blasted thing. And I'm not coming at you. I don't have anybody in mind when I say that. I'm just saying, some of us are working really hard while some of us show up, go home, show up, come, go home, show up. Go, I, are you working hard for the gospel? That's what Paul wants you to, know, wants you to think through. Are you working hard? Because you know what? One day the trump will sound. Jesus Christ will come out of the clouds and Jesus as the suffering servant is, is, is done. It, it's over. He's going to come back as the reigning king in glory. And, and Jeremiah said something, if you, if you look in Revelation, Christ comes back with his robe dipped in blood. Like he is going to be the ruling king and he's going to call us to be with him. And all of us who have spent all of our time wondering about our $1.5 million in our 401ks are going to regret it. And all of us who have spent our time here on this earth reaching and teaching and loving people for the sake of the gospel are going to be rewarded because our work is not in vain. Worship team, why don't you um, come up? So the big, the big question this morning is, are you ready? Are you ready for the rapture? I can't answer that, that question for you this morning. I can tell you that if you've believed on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and if you've understood that it's only by grace and that you can't deserve it, and that by faith you've believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's the basis, that's the foundation for being ready. As we sing, as we, as we worship with the, in this last song, I want you just to think through that question. Like, am I ready? I'm going to be going to, to heaven and I'm going to be giving an account and, and am I working hard? And, and do I believe, I mean, do I have the right answers? We're doing a doctrinal series for Pete's sakes. Like, it, it, what I know is important, but if we miss it all, if we miss Jesus Christ and all of the knowledge, then I hate to say, and I'm afraid to say that you're not ready, because it's about Christ and Him crucified and raised from the dead. So as you, as you stand to worship, I just want you to, if you can answer that question and say, I'm ready, I just want you to worship with all your heart. Worship that God. Like, like worship because I, I, I've said it too many times, because we don't deserve it. And maybe it's just because that's what resonates in my heart this morning. And if you, if you don't know, if you're still kind of questioning, like, take the time to, that during worship to just kind of pray, to try to figure out like, and just be, be convicted and respond to that conviction. And what do I need to do to get ready? And, 
and maybe I need to talk to somebody. Maybe you need to come and talk to me. Maybe you need to talk to the person that brought you. Or maybe, maybe it's very simply just, I, I'm ready to work hard, or, or whatever it is. But as we stand and as we worship, just worship God with all that you are, and just let him begin to move and convict you in your spirit.